What is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act? And what does it mean for civil engineers and their companies? In this episode, I'm joined by Dennis Truax, the current national president of the American Society of Civil Engineers, and he's gonna answer all of these questions. Let's jump right in. Now I'm excited to welcome on our guest for today, Dennis Truax. Dennis is the current national president of the American Society of Civil Engineers. Dennis, welcome to the Civil Engineering Podcast. Well, no, thanks for inviting me. This is a real pleasure and uh, I appreciate you investing the time in me to to be here today. For sure, Dennis. I think our listeners are really excited to hear from you. We always love touching base with ASCE leadership, especially in light of everything that's going on in the world right now. I mean, it's a real busy time for civil engineers, of course, with the Infrastructure Act, which we're going to talk about shortly. But before we do that, let's start with you, Dennis. Tell us about what you do in your day job, what you do for ASCE, and why they're really one and the same right now. Okay. Uh, And the reason you put it that way, as you know, but the listeners may not, uh, after 41 years on the academic faculty, uh, at Mississippi State University, uh, culminating in being the director of the Rural School of Civil and Environmental Engineering, director of the Mississippi Transportation Research Center, um, and, and a number of other things uh, at the state level, working in agencies or whatever, I retired at the end of May 2021. So uh, I did that for a variety of reasons, but in part, uh, it was because I wanted to devote as much time as I could to ASCE and in service to the ASCE membership. Uh, This is an opportunity that I have not really aspired to for very long, but it it was an opportunity that I saw coming and a need to get engaged at this level to, to be impactful. And so my day today, these days, uh, is driven largely by the needs of the membership and, and the society. Uh, one day I'll be speaking to a group internationally via web conference. Uh, the next day I'll be in meetings with uh, organizations, committees, uh, task committees, uh, staff committees, Uh, working on programs, products that uh, improve uh, what we do for civil engineers. Uh, The next day I might be meeting with public officials or giving testimony in a Senate hearing uh, on the infrastructure uh, needs of that community or that particular uh, uh, governmental area. And, And then there's just the horrendous number of conversations and, and uh, engagements that are involved. So uh, talking is a large part of what I do. Being present is a large part of what I do. And uh, after 41 years in an academic environment, uh, talking is not a big problem. In fact, the biggest problem is getting me to shut up. <laughs> well, listen, Dennis, I think that what you do is great. I think that what ASCE does is great. And I think having someone as the president and really representing the profession and doing all of the things that you've just explained is a great thing for us as civil engineers. And we appreciate your dedication and your time. And one thing that you mentioned there that I just want to highlight for those out there that don't know about it is that ASCE does work outside of the United States, correct? Correct. We uh, we have over 150,000 members in ASC at this time, and our membership's actually increasing through a variety of programs that we've been putting in over the past 18 months to 24 months, and 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 that's on a global basis. Uh, we have uh, members of our society today in 177 different countries, and we're expanding. Uh, we're we're looking at. Uh, four or five additional can, uh, countries, uh, even regions that, that have reached out to us to say, we want to be part of ASC. That's great. So Dennis, right now is a busy time for the world of civil engineering. I mean, we work with a lot of civil engineering companies and we hear from a lot of civil engineers here at EMI and they can't even handle their workload right now. And oh, by the way, the biggest piece of legislation related to infrastructure is here which is what I want to talk to you a little bit about today, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. I know ASC has been a huge proponent of lobbying for funding and resources related to infrastructure and a big part of really helping this legislation happen. So talk about this act 
for those that aren't familiar with it and they've heard about it. What is it? Okay. Um, IIJA or the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, as I think most people know, is a $1.2 trillion five year uh, program that invests in something in the neighborhood of about 17 different infrastructure areas. Oh, by the way, all 17 of those areas are outlined and were defined and have been evaluated in our most recent report card. In fact, we've been doing the report card for over two decades. And as a result of this persistence, and in fact, being an honest broker and recognized as an honest broker, yes, civil engineers are gonna benefit uh, from, from the results of what this act is gonna put in place. But, but we did it because uh, of our commitment to protecting the health, safety and welfare of the public. Our commitment as civil engineers to, to make the quality of life better, to support economic and social program per progress. And with that, uh, we also hold up and, and, and acknowledge and celebrate the fact that in that 17 different report card categories that are embraced, there are 43 different specific recommendations that ASE made in our last report card that are actually codified, included specifically in this legislation. Now, what does this mean? It means that, that we talked about a $1.2 trillion deficit in spending as projected at the time of our last report card over the next 10 years. Well, we just got handed $1.2 trillion to be spent and applied to improvement of infrastructure, making better infrastructure for the next five years. So this is obviously going a long way to making up what we anticipate the needs going to be uh, to starting today and in the future. Now, of course, there's a lot more to be done. And this, this funding gap uh, is based on a number of factors. And so uh, our job's not finished. Um, now to talk about specifics, of course, recognize that, that this particular distribution is gonna be a process of uh, using existing programs and some new programs. It's gonna be using uh, formula distributions that are already in place in all of the federal agencies and there are gonna be some grant programs put together, competitive grant programs for, for specific projects that will advance the quality of life and improve economic competitiveness uh, in particular regions. But if you look at, for example, the largest chunk is going to uh, transportation. Uh, the Department of Transportation is getting the lion's share of the funds. And then within that, uh, these funds are going to be going in large part to roads, bridges, uh, and other infrastructure. But it's going to be distributed based on uh, state. Um, I'm going to say demographic, and I mean that in terms of infrastructure demographic. If you're a, a heavy state, as far as the amount of road miles that you have, then there's going to be more money devoted and allocated based on the fact that you've got all these roads to maintain and potentially replace or upgrade. Uh, if you've got a big transit area, then that's going to play into the formula as well. And if you've got a lot of transit, then you're going to get transit dollars. And, and all the different segments within uh, transportation are going to be impacted that way. But then again, if you have a special, let's say you have a special bridge program, and there's several out there that are really change quality of life, cutting down the time, travel time from point A to point B, there's opportunities for funding that as well. That's great, Dennis. So before we go a little bit further on this, I do want to stop for a minute. And I do want to just highlight the ASC Infrastructure Report Card Program. It's a wonderful program. And if you're not familiar with it, I suggest you learn about it. You can do that easily by going back to episode 139 of this podcast. We had on Peyton Gibson. Peyton came on representing ASCE, and she kind of talked through what goes into developing the ASCE report card. She went through the entire process, which is pretty elaborate. And I think it's important for us to know that process as civil engineers. And it's a great process that ASCE has created the report card because what we've I think failed to do in the past is communicate to the public, to legislators, how bad our infrastructure is. And the report card puts it in a way that we can do that, right? Everyone's gotten grades in school, A, B, C. So the report card allows us to assign grades to different structures or regions, maybe put some photos associated with them. And it makes it easier for people to see. And this is important because our duty as civil engineers is to uphold the safety and health of the public and one of the ways for us to do that is to show people how bad or how unsafe things are 
so we can get funding and get legislation like this. So Dennis, all that being said, for those of us that are civil engineers, maybe they're firm owners, maybe they're working professionals, um, and they're already busy, they're going to have to brace themselves, of course, and be prepared with this legislation coming. But talk to us about the funding for this. How is the funding coming if people are kind of bracing themselves for what, for when? Talk about how is this going to be dripped out over years? How is this going to work? Yeah, then let, me, let me back up just half a step from that and, and applaud you for what you just said. Um, I've been using the terminology for most of this uh, cycle uh, with ASCE about becoming servant leaders and recognizing that this profession is a, is a profession, first off, which means we serve others first. Now, that said, that service requires us to stand up and talk to our legislators and talk to our communities about the importance of infrastructure and the impacts that what it is we do and the results of our fruits and our labors uh, as, as professionals, as civil engineers in producing this infrastructure. Oftentimes referred to as municipal infrastructure, but let's also recognize that what that municipal infrastructure does is support commerce, it supports industry, it defines a quality of life. Our role in doing this is essential and we have to stop hiding our light under a basket, as it were, and get out and talk to this. Because if we don't, people uh, are, are going to be left short. It's, it's impact. Now, uh, what was your question again? No. Well, and maybe maybe you give. No, me no, I, I'm just kidding. Uh, the, here's here's what I see. The opportunity is yes. Civil engineers are, are, are in high demand, have been in high demand. Uh, we were one of the professions that continued to work and continue to work through this pandemic that we're dealing with. And at times, uh, I mean, the construction industry, for example, segment of our profession, uh, had to keep building. I mean, they they in they were expected to keep putting uh, buildings up and, and paving roads and, and doing that. So we've continued on. And what this is going to do and the opportunity for firms and for civil engineers individually is to rethink how they do their work. Uh, it's again, engaging. And as an academician, I, I, I suggest you talk to uh, your various groups and I'm talking at the civic level now and emphasizing the opportunities. I, I'm expecting, albeit there's a, a defined, absolutely guaranteed downturn enrollment in, in enrollment for universities as a result of the next dip in population and in that entrance age bracket. We have to fight for a larger share of that and we need to get students in the pipeline to help. But for today, it's going to be a matter of setting oneself apart to take, move into this, thinking new ways, new products, embracing the full community, um, the, the engineers licensed, those engineers who are becoming licensed, uh, those individuals who have uh, expertise to support our profession, engaging uh, the entire STEM society, uh, and then those that are, that are supporting us through their skills. The, the technicians and technologists that we use that run our labs and do our drawings, we need to embrace them as part of this process as well, but as part of re rethinking. And then the last piece I'll challenge all the firms to think about is, and, and as, I'll, as I'll mention as many times as I can, what this is about is building the right project. It's not building projects right alone. It's deciding what it is that has the appropriate life cycle, uh, cost. It has the right use of materials. It's sustainable. It's resilient. It's robust. And, it, and it's done with the vision for the 21st century, not based on the, the technology of the 19th century. And so we need to be thinking forward. And I think those firms that look at new approaches and apply new processes, materials to these solutions are going to be a head and shoulders above those who choose not to. Part of that, of course, then means that these projects are going to be actually larger in scope. It's not just building a road, it's building a transportation corridor. It's, it's building a, a corridor for telecommunications and power and water and sewer and storm, and as well as a variety of vehicles, pedestrian, bike, autonomous, car, truck, commercial, and the list goes on. So we've got to really think outside of the box. And those individuals that are creative and think, uh, I think are going to be the successful ones. The challenge 
the, the hurdle against this is getting so bogged down in the day to day that not taking the time to vision for the future. And, that's, and, I, and I acknowledge that's a problem, but it's going to be time management. It's going to be an application of people. And it's going to be uh, really a, a paradigm for engineering that ASE has been talking about for over 20 years. Again, another, another two decades talking about a different way of doing engineering. Uh, delegation, management, uh, visioning, uh, creativity. It's what we do. And Dennis, these funds will be coming soon, the first wave of them? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, well, the, the first wave of funds is, is again, primarily kind of be coming through the transportation. It's going to be focused on roads. Uh, that formula is well established. That, that formula is in place. And Secretary Buttigieg is literally meeting today with people in, in transportation, some states' transportation. Uh, I've talked to several DOT officials uh, across the US and they are all being asked to come in and sit down with the secretary and outline how they want to immediately apply. What they're, what we commonly jokingly sometimes say are shovel ready projects in the transportation area with particular roads. And that's, that's going to be the first deployment. Bridges will come online very quickly after that in the transportation area. And then the distribution of funds for the other programs will, will follow thereafter. All right, great. So a couple of last questions on this. One of them being, you mentioned all the different things that we need to think about going forward. Autonomous vehicles. Um, we've had people come on the podcast saying that our roads are going to start talking to the cars. Um, there's going to be all kinds of sensors and, and all new technologies coming. And so I think based on your background, you can probably speak to this, but for engineers in this country that are going to school, civil engineers, you know, they're getting their undergraduate degrees. How do they address that? So what I mean by that is, are these schools, are they addressing some of these newer technologies in the curricula or are we not there yet? Or are these things just going to have to be taught in industry? Well, let, let's acknowledge that a large part of, and it's been said a lot of different ways, a large part of what's being taught in the collegiate environment is history. This is what we've done. Right. This is how we've done it. These are the formulas, equations, materials, processes, approaches that we've used historically. And we do this in the academic environment, not to say that this is the way it has to be done for the future, but this is, this is the foundation from which you then move forward in developing those new approaches. Um, the, the one thing that we emphasize in academics uh, and engineering community uh, is learning to learn. The, the lifelong learning is the way it's oftentimes couched, but it's really a process of learning to learn. You never know what that next project's gonna be. You never know what that next problem's gonna be. And you never know what the approach to solving that problem is gonna be. And that's why it's so important that we, we give the engineers uh, of, of today and tomorrow the skill set. Uh, advanced mathematics, advanced science, uh, the, the all applying in that foundation, not just to the history part, but to give the skill set to learn and, and grow and research and develop these new methodologies. I'm excited. I, the, 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 the curricula that we have in place today uh, in accredited programs uh, for engineering across the United States all embrace this concept to varying levels. And, and certainly there's, there's just differences between one program and another. Uh, but a lot of times those differences are based on two fundamental issues. What are the demands of the graduates of that program? And what are the resources we're bring, able to bring to bear in order to achieve our educational goals? Yeah, that's great. And I agree. I think you have to have a really good background and fundamentals in what you do in your profession, like you suggested, and then you could build off of that. And I think the learning mentality is critical in everything we do today. Because the last few years have kind of showed us already that we constantly have to adapt and change and do different things. And that's critical. And I guess, you know, the biggest challenge that I see here is just everyone that we talk to in terms of civil engineering companies, they're busy to the max right now. They're having trouble hiring enough people to do the work. And now this infrastructure act is only going to bring more work. So I really see this as one of the biggest challenges However, I see ASCE as one of the leading organizations that can help with this challenge by inspiring our youth to get into civil engineering. But you know the equation right now. 
We're busy. We can't hire enough people. And here's more work. The equation doesn't add up that well. Well, and, I, and I, again, I'm not going to challenge that assertion because it's, it is fact. And, and it's not just the consultants. Uh, the departments of transportation uh, are finding that um, they've got a lot of people that are retiring at going to those consulting firms to help fill that gap, uh, which then leaves the, the departments of transportation who are already struggling with uh, being competitive in an increasingly competitive marketplace uh, for talent. And so uh, it, it is a problem and it's not, it's not one that we can immediately solve, but it's one that, again, it's gonna be a matter of creatively, creatively applying uh, the, the resources that are available. As I said, it, it may be a matter of recognizing that a professional engineer doesn't need to be in a doing a particular task. That they can that an individual with a technical skill set. I'm just going to frame it in the broad sense and say a STEM skill set mm -hmm. can actually do the job under the tutelage or under the supervision of somebody that has uh, the expertise to do that. So it's it's getting out of this box of of one person being everything. And this is why I said we've been saying this for, for 20 years at ASCE. Uh, in the last century it was oftentimes expected that one engineer would be the lead. I, I designed a, a, a landfill that had a economic uh, net value of oh, almost $200 million. And I was the only engineer on the project. Uh, that's, that's been a while now, but I, that, I mean, I did that in the, the early part of mid part of the nineties. Uh, and I was working for the university full time. So this was a part-time gig for me. Um, I would never try and do that today. Uh, you know, the, 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 just the demands, the regulations, the science. Uh, I'd be bringing people, geologists, I'd be bringing biologists, I'd be bringing uh, a variety of individuals into this uh, design team. Uh, and, and, and that's what we're going to have to do. We just don't have any choice. We're going to have to rely on the talents of the broad spectrum of STEM led by engineers supervised by engineers, uh, tutored by engineers to pick up on, on that uh, uh, resource gap that we have, the human resource gap that we're struggling with. But uh, it, it's still going to be there, and this is going to plug in, and, and a lot of uh, the work that's going to come out of this infrastructure act is going to be incrementally larger. It's not, I mean, uh, I think the increase in spending on transportation is going to be about 60% of what it would have been under the FAST Act. And it's broader than what we had uh, under the Obama administration in 2009. So you're gonna have more depth, more breadth in terms of that particular area. But let's also point out that there are some areas where the level of funding is gonna be horrendously larger. Uh, ports uh, is getting uh, 17 times what it would normally have been budgeted. So there's going to be a lot of work for in areas that civil engineers probably haven't been working much in. So I, I wish I had a solution. Uh, I guess I could come out of retirement and help out, but uh, I don't think that's going to have a big plug for a very big hole. So yeah. anyway. So my last point on this here, Dennis, it sounds like if companies out there are interested in keeping up to date on projects that are coming down from the act, they should be in communication with their DOTs. Is that correct? Yes. If, if that's their area of expertise, they need to be talking with their state DOTs because they're going to be the distribution point. Uh, US DOT, uh, Secretary begins talking with the state DOTs in terms of putting up a strategy and a timeline for implementation, implementation and deployment of projects. So I, I, if I was interested in working in that area, I'd be, I'd be on the doors of, or in the halls of my state DOT, uh, finding out how we get connected and how we find out about the projects and what the state timeline is for distribution, because different states will have different timelines. As I said, the, pre the secretary is talking to each of these state administrators. And so it's not, all, it's not one big conversation. It's an individualized conversation. Secretary Buttigieg is meeting with each state's representative to talk about how to deploy these funds, and they're custom designing it to, uh, to have the greatest impact as quickly as possible to start uh, deploying these funds. Uh, so it's it's a it's an ongoing process. Yeah, that's great, Dennis. Thank you. So for those of you out there that 
aren't that familiar with the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, you've heard about it here. I hope that some of this information was helpful to you to learn a little bit more about the act. Like I said, it's an exciting time for civil engineers. Make no mistake about it. There will be a lot of work to do. And there may be some challenges like we talked about here in terms of workforce challenges and finding the right people. But like Dennis said, we have to be leaders. We have to lead people. We're going to have to help people get through these projects and really think differently to try to get through them. So yeah. what we're going to do now, oh, go ahead, Dennis. I think if, if I may, and, and I'm not trying to get the last word, but I do want to add one more thing to that end. Uh, for those individuals who are members of ASC, uh, ASC has just put together and launched a program to help our members uh, get an excellent perspective on IIJA. And that, that this web-based program will help individuals understand how to target, how to develop the resources internally needed to competitively go after the funds that are coming down. And I really, I, I, I personally, I have, in all honesty, I haven't looked at it myself, but I know the staff that developed them and, I, and they are well-versed in, in what we're talking about. And I have gotten feedback from members who have participated in it and they think it is stellar. So uh, go to the ASC website, asc.org, could be easier. And look look for the IJA uh, web, webinar. If you have trouble, reach out to ASC and we'll get you hooked up uh, with uh, this program. It, it, is, it will give you a leg up on, on exactly what you're talking about, Anthony. That's great, Dennis. We'll find the link to that resource and we'll put it in the show notes so all of our listeners can find it. Thank you to ASC again for doing that and just promoting resources for civil engineers. All right, so we're not quite done with Dennis yet. We're going to come back in a minute and we're going to put Dennis on the civil engineering career hot seat. We are back with Dennis Truax, the national ASCE president. We've talked a lot about the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and all that money that's coming. It's really exciting stuff. But now we're going to put Dennis into our career hot seat and ask him a little about his career progression. Dennis, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> all right. So first question here, do you have any specific rituals that you practice every day? Do you have a specific morning routine or a lunchtime routine or just something that you do consistently on a daily basis that has contributed to your success? Well, when I was working, uh, routines were more of a routine. Uh, today, being retired, uh, routine is getting up, doing what I want to, when I want to, for whom I want to, to the degree <laughs> I want to. And, and that's not much of a routine, but but. Having thinking about that, now that you posed the question, let, let me tell you a routine I do go through. I don't do it every day, but it is a routine. And and this is I'm not talking about whether I shave first or shower first. Right. I'm talking now I just scarred the, the entire podcast because now everybody sees me in the shower, and that's a horrible vision. But anyway, the the here's a routine I go through, uh, and and it's when I'm going out into society when I'm going out into the community, when I'm basically leaving the house. First thing I do is put on my wedding ring. I do that, I, I, this is true ritual. I really do, out of the three rings I'm gonna put on my hands, I put on my wedding ring. I do that first because I'm again acknowledging uh, my wife, who is my best friend and my partner and my advocate. Uh, those on the podcast probably noticed that I wear a necklace and most people think that's very 70s, and it probably is. But this necklace is also family, too. I wear this necklace much the same way as I wear my wedding ring. It represents family. The, the, the pendant is something that my daughters literally mined out of the hills of North Carolina uh, wow. and, and that had made into a piece of jewelry and gave to me. So I wear the necklace to, to, to honor my family, all three of them, my, my wife and two daughters. Uh, I wear the wedding ring as a further symbol and recognition that I have a partner for life. And, and, and that's part of that ritual. Two, second ring goes onto my hand is my college class ring. I, it's stupid, I know. I graduated from Virginia Tech. <laughs> 
And um, my class ring, class ring I have is the 1975 class ring by all, by all the information that I have. It is the singularly largest class ring that will ever be made in the United States. We used to joke about back in the 70s that if you went into the state of New York, you had to register it as a lethal weapon. It was so big. <laughs> and uh, I do that in part because it's so freaking heavy that my hand feels wrong if it's not there. It's a ballast thing. Uh, it's also, I guess, an acknowledgement uh, of a level of academic attainment. I've, I've always respected all three of my degrees. My second and third degree, my master's and PhD, both came from Mississippi State. Um, as a result of wanting to get a master's and going to consulting, which didn't turn out the way I planned. Uh, and a lot of that was, again, founded on my education at Virginia Tech. So the one class ring actually represents all three of the degrees to me. And I acknowledge that I have those degrees and therefore have a responsibility to use them for the betterment of others, which then brings me to the third ring. I'm a member of the Order of the Engineer. I, uh, I don't know if you can see a TV, whatever you mean, what it is. Yeah. It's a little steel ring on a little finger. And I invite you to look up the Order, Order of the Engineer. Uh, it is a organization that was put together for engineers. It's not exclusive to professional engineers. Anybody that graduates from engineering degree part of it. And what the, we, we, we wear it on the little finger of our working hand. In my case, I'm right-handed, so it's on my right hand. Um, and what it means is when you put that hand out and you are working, that ring is a constant reminder that you're an engineer and as such, you're professionally responsible for the lives of other people and the improvement of, of lives of other people and, and the economics and social condition that they exist in. So that ring is, is my reminder, and it's the last thing I put on, as a, a reminder that again, I'm a professional engineer and my responsibility is to others first. And so that's my ritual. If they, they, they recognize me, their, their, their ritual is about recognizing my responsibility to make the lives of others better and to honor the obligations that I have taken on over my life. That's great, Dennis. Thank you for sharing that with us. And the order of the engineer is great. If you're interested, you can look it up online. I believe they have ceremonies regularly where you can attend and they can size you and get you a ring. Yes, absolutely correct. All right. Next question, Dennis. What is one book that you might recommend to an engineer? And it doesn't have to be an engineering book at all. Just a book that's been really helpful for you in your personal and or professional development. And I know that there are a lot of books out there. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of books. And I'm not even going to point to my dissertation. <laughs> I just published it available in print. No, don't, 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 don't. It is available for to go for it, please. Uh, I, I, the book that jumps out in my mind right now is the book that I'm currently reading through. Uh, Dr. Stuart Walsh, uh, a friend, um, is an author, educator, researcher. Stu's just put out a book, I say just, within the past year, and that's why I say I'm, I'm just getting through it. Engineering, <clears throat> let me say it again. Engineering's Public Protection Predicament. <whistles> Rubber baby buggy bumpers. Uh, the, Stewart's book takes a really honest look at what it means to be a professional engineer and how we do and do not effectively protect the public in what we do. And this predicament comes, as he's talked about, and as I've said to others as well, it comes from the fact that this profession did not continue to grow and morph and recognize a broader responsibility like the other professions. If you look where engineering was in, uh, at the beginning of the last century, uh, we had a higher education requirement. We put more demands on our graduates than even doctors did. But look where doctors are today and architects are today, and accountants are today, and dentists are today, and, and, the, and the list goes on. And we as civil engineers, excuse me, we as engineers, it's not just civils, we as engineers have abrogated our responsibility to maintain the, the educational standards and relegated this responsibility to universities to manage much the same way as they advantage, uh, manage arts and sciences classes and liberal arts classes and everything else. 
And so they've been, we've been subjected to uh, a number of factors that have put uh, this profession and our ability to protect ourselves, safety, welfare of the public in jeopardy. And I think he's captured to the extent that I've read so far. And based on the comments of my friends who have or are reading it, um, I think it's, a, it's, I recommend it highly. I think it's a book that anybody in this profession should pick up. Um, and then I could go on to a list of about three other authors <laughs> read routinely, but uh, most of those are management books. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a Simon Sinek fan. Okay. And he, he's on. Start with why. Yeah. And then, and then uh, uh, Mark Sanborn is another author that is a prolific author and speaker and talks about service leadership and, and engagement. And, those, just any of their textbooks, anything they write, I end up reading. Okay, great, great. And Stuart's been on the podcast a few times. He's great. He's got a lot of great information for engineers out there. All right, next question, Dennis. Thinking about some of your managers from the past, or maybe just managers or leaders in the world of civil engineering that you know, what are some of the traits of really great managers in the world of civil engineering, especially now? Like you said, the world is evolving and there are much more complex and bigger projects. So what are some of the traits of the best leaders in civil engineering that you found? Ooh, you want my leadership lecture. Uh, let me pull up my slides. <laughs> um, I think the single most important thing that an engineering manager, a professional engineer in charge of an office or even a corporation needs to recognize is that their single greatest resource, if not their only resource, are the people that work for them. Um, we're not manufacturing widgets here. Right. Uh, uh, our product is, is creative. Our product, and I don't mean that in the sense that those people that, design, that are engineers that make widgets uh, aren't product. That's not what I mean here. What I mean is that that our, our resource are those people that are creative and come up with those solutions and, and serve the, the need of the company by serving the need of the client. And, and if we have a workforce that is under-resourced, under-appreciated, uh, they, they become disgruntled, they become uh, less productive. And, and I say this, I emphasize this, because this is one of the missions I've been talking about some time. The expectations of employees today needs to change to represent the mindset of the employees today. What my generation considered success is not what the current generation considered success. So if we're still applying the same yardstick to, that we used 20, 30 years ago, even even 10 years ago in some regards as metrics for defining success and we don't validate again validate that with the workforce do they want more money yeah, everybody wants more money mm -hmm. but i management 101 i've known this for 30 years anybody's taking management knows this money doesn't make you happy not getting money makes you mad okay so money okay but it's workplace environment it's appreciation it's all those things that keep people from burning out and then i mentioned earlier it's also giving people time to be creative this push to have individuals be at 100 percent billable hours i know that's not what people are pushing everybody talking about but this the, 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 you've got to have i mean if i've got to be working every single minute of the day when i take a break and read my journal when i take a break and think about what could be not what is so I, in framing it in a lot of different ways and pulling all that piece together, that's, that's the one lesson I've seen from successful managers. They recognize that, that they are where they are because of the people that they work with, not the people that are under them, the people they work with in order to assure that the products that they're putting out, the designs, the, the, the construction projects, the planning projects, everything that we do uh, is successful. That's great, Dennis. And I think it's timely, especially based on what we've talked about here in this episode, all of this funding coming. There's going to be so much money and the, the salaries are going to be competitive in a lot of firms, right? People can go to different firms and get similar amounts of money. 
but it's really about the workplace environment. It's about the culture in the company. It's about how people are treated by their managers. So I think that that's great. And, and let me remember also, Anthony, it's also work-life balance. This idea of people working, I, I can't count on my hands or toes. Uh, all the people that I've heard complain and leave companies because they got tired of the 60 hour a week, mm -hmm. week in and week out work. I mean, there is more to life for this generation than making a buck <clears throat> or the promise of making a bonus. It's work-life balance. It's living in the present. It's, it's having impact. Uh, it's, it's having impact in the society uh, as a corporation, as an individual. Uh, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a big piece. And it's, it's tough to do. And it requires talking to people, not just looking at data and saying, oh, yeah, they should be happy. Or yeah, no, for sure. I yeah. And I think with people working from home a lot more, that becomes more difficult, of course, right? The line. There is no more line between home and work. I mean, there used to be kind of a blurred line and now there's zero line. You're literally working at home. So this becomes very difficult. Excellent point. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Dennis, I've got one final question for you. We call it the civil engineering career elevator advice question. If you got into an elevator with a young civil engineer and you had 30 to 40 seconds to give him or her career advice, what would it be? <laughs> well, I made my living doing this, but it took usually about 50 to 60 minutes. You want me to, you want me to do it in 30 seconds. Oh, okay. Um, this is what I give you. This is what I tell students in the intro class, told students in my intro class and in my senior design class. Routinely. Find your passion. Find your passion for change. Find your passion for this profession. Embrace it. Recognize that you can be impactful as a civil engineer. Recognize that you have abilities that nobody else has that will make you, if you apply yourself, the best version of a civil engineer you can be. We all have different abilities, aptitudes, interests, and priorities. And that's all fine. That all factors into this. But developing a passion for this profession and for the opportunities this profession provides allows students in their first year to get through that, what I call brick wall class. It might be dynamics, it could be calculus four, it could be differential equations, it could be a civil design class. Whatever that class is that you hit, you go, man, I just, maybe I should change majors. But if you've got a passion, you're willing to push through the hard times to get to the reward on the other end. That's, that makes the difference. Get the passion. With that passion and with that commitment, you cannot be stopped. And I think I just went to the extra floor. No, that's, that's great. And I, I think as we've talked about today, there are many different types of jobs in the world of civil engineering today. And those jobs are going to keep evolving with new technologies. So definitely find your passion. You will find something to do in the world of civil engineering. Just make sure that you're doing something that you love. And believe me, it will be certainly an exciting ride. Just like Dennis sounds like he's had a very exciting ride in his career. So Dennis Truax, 2022 ASCE National President, thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy day, your busy travel schedule and spending some time with us on the Civil Engineering Podcast. Oh, Anthony, again, thank you very much for having me. This has been a lot of fun. I have been enjoyed engaging with you. And, and the work you're doing is really good. I've, I've watched a couple of your podcasts. I'm not all, how many of 200? Well, yeah, no, I don't think I've watched them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you've lived them. But you do a great job. And I appreciate what it is that you're doing and, and the way you're lifting up this information for everybody to consume. It's, it, it, thanks a lot. Thank you, Dennis. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dennis Truax, National President of the American Society of Civil Engineers. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel here. We put out videos like this on a weekly basis to help engineers become the best managers and leaders that they can be. We'll see you next week.